This is Rick. Good afternoon. Hello, Two this participants is are now joining. Hello, Rick. Yep. Okay. Chairman, you have uh, yourself, uh, Vice Chairman Reynolds, uh, Director Pardo, Director Moxley, and Director Perez. You, you have a quorum at this time. Okay, we're going to go do the Pledge of Allegiance. Start off with that. I pledge allegiance to the flag United States of America. United States of America. The Republic of One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. And justice for all. Invocation? Chairman? Yes, sir. Dear Father God, we commit this meeting into your hands. Help us to find long-lasting solutions to the problems we are facing. We know that even though things may be impossible on our side, all things are possible with you. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. Amen. 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 Go ahead and call Chairman, the meeting believe... for the workshop, uh, item number one. Yes, sir. Chairman, He's also, I, I believe Director I believe Director Reyna has joined us. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Welcome, Zeke. Hi, hi, Chairman. How are you doing, sir? Good. Okay. okay. Chairman, the item one of the workshop is a review of the quarterly investment report for the period ending March 31st, 2020. Uh, in your packet is the uh, quarterly investment statement. Um, you can see that um, for our, um, our local government investment pool, uh, our beginning balance was... Um, $6,978,987. Our ending balance is now joining. Uh, our ending balance was uh, $7,001,513. Um, so our average uh, weighted yield, our weighted average yield, excuse me, was 1.66%. Uh, On the government securities, um, our beginning balance was. Um, Three hundred and sixty thousand eight hundred and ninety three dollars um, and then our ending balance was um, one million three I'm sorry one million um, three hundred and ninety thousand five hundred and twelve so our, our rated average yield was point eight eight percent Sarah Teak Ramirez so, and company is now joining so we lost uh, we lost a little bit of our uh, uh, interest on the government securities and our, our local our local pool cash is still um, still producing revenue for us. And if you have any questions? Are there any questions? No. If not, let's go into uh, I uh, workshop on item number two. Chairman Directors, item number two is discussion of the 365 Tollway project financing update. We have uh, Richard Ramirez with uh, Hilltop Securities on the line to discuss the um, latest uh, analysis of the 365 toll road financing uh, utilizing the current uh, market rates. And so, as you all know, the, the market rates are extremely low, but there's still some challenges with financing the project. And I'll allow um, Richard Ramirez to explain that. Um, Richard. Richard, are you on the line? Yes, sir. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, so, um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, board members. Also with me is uh, my colleague, uh, Kobe Eccles. Um, wanted to, as Pilar said, review um, his numbers. Uh, Pilar, do they have the schedules I sent? Yes, sir, they do. Okay. Um, so, um, I'll give the brief uh, summary and then I'm happy to go into all the detail that um, you might want to if you have any questions. But we ran we ran two scenarios um, basically using the data and information from the numbers we ran last fall with respect to the capital costs, the capex and the O and M uh, operating and maintenance and G and A expenses. Um, we ran this both of the scenarios we ran, we ran um, taking out refinancing, paying off, however you want to call it, uh, the the SIP loan with tech stock. 
Um, and then in one scenario, we did not, I think it's the first one, we did not utilize the 27 million that is being solicited from uh, TechStot for con additional contribution. And then we ran one with a $27 million, uh, which I believe is a request to TechStot, uh, $27 million TechStot contribution. The scenario without the contribution uh, fell somewhat short, uh, and, and we use rates as of April the 8th. Um, rates, uh, you know, during as, as the, we got into COVID-19, rates just kind of got completely away. In fact, there was really not a market to price, and then the market opened up <clears throat> once the government is now joining. The, the, um, so the market kind of came back in once the government provided some of the relief uh and rates you know came came back down to not quite where we were before but uh at least somewhat closer and then um the last few weeks they kind of got away from us but as of april the 8th i think we're still today around where that market was in april on april the 8th so the the scenario without the contribution um the senior lien bonds were at about a one and a half coverage or so uh, which, you know, makes it kind of close to do a financing and get it rated. But the subordinate debt that we're replacing the tech stock loan with is, you know, spelled to like a 1.16. And that, that will not get us a rating uh, investment grade anyway. And, and there's still really no market access at this, at this time for, for a deal like that. So the numbers that with the contribution, uh, we got up to about, almost 1.8 times in coverage uh, on the senior debt. And then the subordinate debt is about 1.40, 1.35 or so. So that that would allow us to, to I think, access the market at those levels. We're using uh, excess vehicle registration fee um, revenues to support the deal. We're using um, the uh, overweight uh, permit fees to offset maintenance. We're not pledging those. We don't have permission to pledge those, but we can offset maintenance costs. And so, you know, bottom line is, um, you know, we we do expect, um, you know, the market to keep improving our rates to stay low. Uh, I, you know, it's just difficult to predict and difficult um, what happens economically and with the virus and so forth in terms of, um, uh, rates and market access liquidity and so forth. So um, my view is that um, at this point, uh, we should probably follow the tech stock preliminary schedule they've given us and hopefully they're still on schedule and be able to uh, finance the project uh, in the fall of next year. I'm happy to answer any questions um, on any of this. So your recommendation is to wait? Well, at this point, uh, Chair Chairman, we, we don't, there's there's not any way unless we reduce the capital costs um, to be able to finance the project as it stands right now. Well, what's our timeline on this? How much time do we have? Uh, to our answer that. Yeah. Uh, Director right now the based on the the latest schedule is that we're not anticipating to let the project till March of 2021 based on the current funding schedule that TechStot has shared with us um, we're not going to we're going to we're not going to see approval uh, of the gap funding until uh, August of um, 2020 this year and then by the time we get the approvals from the Te Texas Transportation Commission uh, it'll be January or February and then you know we we've got a 60-day letting schedule so that pushes us to March 2021 well yeah that's for letting but you got to go back to have our financing in order what, what, what the, what's the schedule for that so the letting, I mean, the financing won't come until we have letting so that we have the number 
the final number that we need to finance. So they they kind of, they run concurrently. How can we how can we do a lending if we don't have the financing? Well, I think we've run the. You, we did cut the contract, contract. And, it, and, it, and it got so far. We're following the same same schedule and the same route. If in fact you did the letting, you did everything, and you couldn't do the financing, why are you doing it backwards again? That that's the that's if the I, model that we I, have. I, 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 I don't know. I'm asking. I'm not a financier. We got five bankers on on, on the board, and I don't know. I'm just asking. Well, what happened? Is there is there other sources of funding? You go through a process of getting the project, right? And then you go out for the bid process. And after you get the bid process, uh, what had happened before was uh, the cost that came out after the letting, right, came out significantly higher than it was. It was like a two-year wait. And if you recall right now, we're not going to be able to start getting bids again until February of 2022. So they just approved the shortfall that we had based on a bid that was based on 2018 information. Can you imagine what the shortfall is going to be going into 2021 to bid now the project again? It's like this well, round that's ball. My, that's my question, Mr. Kerry, that we're going to go through all of this, and then we go back to letting and find out that that the contractors are not within the within reach for us to be able to, to get this project, which is what happened last time. Yes, sir. I, I agree with you, but that's the way I guess TechStot wants it or has always done it. And Pilar, I wouldn't defer to you, but that's, that's the way. When I got here in 16, it's been the same thing over and over and over again. It was kind yeah, of yes, sir. Was, oh, sorry. Can I interject? Go ahead, Blake. Um, this, this so is it, Richard. It, it was uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, Richard. Go ahead. Yeah, the we cannot finance the project without having a firm contract amount. Um, and and the contract is um, always uh, executed, I guess, conditional for the financing to happen within so many days, which would happen rather quickly after we have a contract that's signed that we accept. Um, so that, I, um, unfortunately, that's the way the, the, the process goes. If there's some other funds that we have been, I guess, trying to figure out any other funds, a way we could finance it. And at this point, if TechStop were to move up their schedule or, or be able to speed up their process, we would be able to finance this as soon um, as soon as they would give us a commitment to fund the shortfall. Um, until then, it's just, uh, it, it, unfortunately, that's, that's the only way to do a project finance of this size. The other thing is just to add, we we can we cannot get a rating on the project unless we have a firm contract amount. Well, we can't get a contract amount if we don't know if we have the finances. Uh, obviously, we need some legal advice on this as to which one comes first, uh, Mr. Chair. This is this is Blakely. Um, you know, typically. When you do a design bid build project, you've got the revenues of a city or a county or TxDOT, and so um, you know you you can line projects up as you've got money to do them, and um, and you do the letting with a lot of a big cash balance and reserve. It's very different when you're trying to do bonds specifically tailored around a project cost, and it's just it's it's an awkward scenario. It was a choice we made when we decided not to go design build, but it's, I mean, we're, we're just sort of stuck now with you know, two, two pieces that don't fit well together in terms of which one goes first. What you want is a really good engineer's estimate uh, that's updated and that can give us the best possible guidelines as to what our project cost will be. And I know that, um, that the team has been doing that and they follow TechStot's cost matrix. Our last estimate just, you know, it was too far from what the bids were. Um, and that's a hard one to explain. In a perfect world, our engineer's estimate should be a really good guidance for how those bids are gonna come in. And so you know, I think that's 
that's our best bet is focusing our attention on on how we're constructing our costs so that we can Blakely, be better Blakely, aligned. That sounds, Blakely, Blakely uh, that sounds great in theory. How in the heck are we going to know that we're going to get the appropriate engineering? That was well, we have, a, I mean, we have a GEC, and they look at they look at the text dot letting schedule, Ramon or Pilar can probably walk you through these details more specifically, but you know, they look at the per item cost that text dot allows and, and that they average out on bids in the region. Um, you know, we know a little bit more now. We know we came in high because folks were worried about getting materials down to the Valley. Um, they were worried about the, the cost of materials maybe being higher in the Valley for a project of this size. And so, you know, we can build some of those um, variables in as we look at the project going forward. And I think Eric has done all of that. But it, it's for sure a chicken and an egg situation. I don't know, Mr. Director. Maybe, this we, we, maybe we should just do a workshop on that one issue. I don't know. Yeah, but I, I think we've got. You've got some some bids and proposals are you going to let out for 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 uh bid in october right that's that the plan uh, well that that was our current schedule until we met with TechStot about a month ago and then you know they they pushed our schedule back to um march 2021 that's what we we had uh probably 45 days ago 60 days ago that that's what was our our, our schedule was until they let us know that the approval process was not going to let us go forward until March 2021. But Chairman and Directors, just to just to give you some history, um, our our previous GEC uh, severely under underestimated the construction cost. They they estimated it at at approximately 170 million dollars. When we when we solicited bids, we came in at at uh, 202 million. Since then. The staff has has updated the estimate, and we're currently at approximately 255 million. So we think we've got a a very realistic um, estimate for the project now, and that's a big difference between 170 million and 255 million. Um, and so we think, and so the financing plan that Richard just um, reviewed with you is based on. The two hundred and fifty five million dollar construction estimate. What was the estimate last time? About one thirty or something? Uh one seventy. One seventy. So so the diff so what's changed this go round is that we've got a much better estimate um that's more in line and then we've analyzed that against statewide unit prices, we've gone and compared it against projects that are comparable in size and scope to um, the 365 project. We went back and looked at the bids we received, because we did receive five bids um, during the first go around. So we looked at those unit prices. Um, and so we, we've done quite a bit, uh, Eric and Ramon have actually done quite a bit of bid analysis um, to get us to that revised estimate. What were the estimates? What were the bid amounts on the other five? Pilar? They ranged 202 was the low, and I'm going to say about 260. It's uh, a mid range, about two. Yeah. The average. The average was 235. Yeah, Ramon says yeah. His he recalls the average was 200 and about 235 million was the mid range or the midpoint, and the low was 202. And I'm going to say the high was about 280. Close to 280. Yeah, about 280, and then everything in between. And so right now we're sitting at about 255 million with our estimate. Okay. I think we can get all this resolved by the next time, Zeke. Hopefully. Okay. Okay. I have a lot of questions, but we'll just do it during our general meeting. That's fine. Yes, sir. And and um, we're planning um, to have a full board meeting for May, um, so we'll have all the board members in the room. Just 
make sure we keep my distance from the other directors. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Works well, I'm, I'm happy to go over in detail every <clears throat> facet of the financing if somebody needs um, need to explain anything further. Hello, this is uh, Pete Alvarez. Hello, this is Pete Alvarez with Techstar. Can you hear me? Who? Hey, Pete. Pete. Pete Alvarez with Techstar. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, just a uh, gentleman with a uh, with uh, just want to give an update. Uh, Pilar is exactly right. Uh, we did have a meeting, Techstar and uh, and your staff. We talked about the process. The timeline that he provided is accurate. We have to wait until August of 2021 for the new UTP to be approved. Once that is done, it enables us to go to the next steps. There are a lot of uh, legal uh, formalities that need to be taken place. And therefore, we anticipate that come January of 2021, we would be in a position to request the remaining federal funding from, the, from uh, as far as federal funding and also state funding for this project. The project estimate of 255, in my opinion, is a lot more realistic. Uh, if you look at bidders two and three, if I'm going off of memory here, their, their estimates were actually rather close to each other, which uh, on the, in the engineering world tells us that that should have been the actual cost. Now, that did happen back in 2017. There's been inflation since then. So the $255 million estimate is pretty, in my opinion, is a very good estimate. In addition to that, I will remind everybody there's about $126 million already invested in this by Textile and the federal uh, funding. Uh, we are in the process of securing an additional $27 million to make up the shortfall. And then the $100 million or so through bonds would b basically finance completely the $255 million for this project. Rest assured that Textile will continue to work very closely with your staff to ensure that we're meeting the, the appropriate timelines. And we are available to answer any questions that you may have uh, as we move forward on this very important project. Are there any questions? Okay. If not, can I get the way to move from the adjourn the workshop and go into the reports? I guess we have public comment. Uh, Chairman, this is We have nobody signed up for public comment at this point unless um, there's somebody on the line that would like to comment on an item. So we've got a quorum, and let's go ahead and go into our reports for our regular meeting. Uh, Chairman Directors, item um, 1A is a report on program manager activity for the 365 Tollway project and the IBTC environmental clearance document. Uh, Eric Davila is going to give you a brief report. Good afternoon. This is Eric Davila. Uh, in the in the board packet, slide number four, uh, we pick off uh, on some of the comments that uh, Pete Alvarez from TechSot chimed in about that uh, we do have um, 2021 UTP draft funding table that was released in November of 2019. Um, and that's taken us through a couple iterations of meetings, uh, programming the project at the MPO to be able to ready it for the revised schedule, which is shown on slide page number six. There's a tentative schedule that has been updated for the project that shows that here, uh, here this month we just submitted to the RGV MPO, so this is a tip revision to be able to program the project uh, with the following schedule and with the potential additional funding for the 2021 UTP program. Um, now, the the 2021 UTP funding program monies uh, will get you know will get shown to the public in in, in around the August timeframe and will get adopted by the commission. And so at that point, uh, we would know for certain if that, that funding is available 
um, you know, given all of the the upheaval from the COVID-19 response. But uh, we march on and we, we're programming it to be able, be able to anticipate a uh, basically a, a January of 2021 where we receive that uh, FPAA modification, which is Texas request to the feds for the additional gap funding, which uh, Pete Alvarez mentioned, which leads us into a time period where we're able to release and advertise a project in around the March of 2021 timeframe as Pilar reiterated. So that kind of tells the, the sequence of activities there outlines what it is we're going to do. We've already ready the TNR study that we're going to, we're going to need to be able to go to market. And uh, essentially, we've already outlined with TxDOT staff um, what it is we're going to have to modify and or update as part of our bid uh, package. Um, and so we have a monthly meeting that we're, we're waiting to pin down, uh, hear back from, from TxDOT staff on when we can hold these monthly calls, but we're basically going to start working ourselves into a program to be ready on this time frame. Any questions on the 365 toll? No, sir. No. Okay. On the IBTC, uh, uh, from a, from a big picture standpoint, we're still trying to get to a to to try to get as close to a uh, a mid. In this case, probably the fall 2020 environmental clearance. We uh, we really have one uh, big resource to to get over at this point, and it's the uh, the archaeological resources. There's a an item on the agenda later on in the agenda which addresses an archaeological mitigation plan. Um, which is essentially one of the last requirements we have here to be able to um, finalize our, the chapter of the environmental assessment document, the EA clearance document, that uh, that has to do with that particular resource. And the long and short of that is that we have to outline to text out how it is we're going to uh, mitigate. And in this case, it would probably be through uh, select, um, you know, digging up and curating of some of the archaeological sites that we found along the right of way and uh, being able to make sure that there are no encumbrances in construction or in operations uh, because of those deposits that might interfere with like a roadside ditch or like a pipeline that we may have to lay for a utility relocation, for instance. So um, TxDOT has you know, taken the position that they'd like to see more specifics about that now versus in design where you would probably see some of that information uh, really get generated and fine-tuned. We're doing it from the from the archaeological perspective and trying to get that cleared now so that we can- uh, Sarah Chief, Ramirez and Is now exiting. And finalize the environmental as soon as possible. Any questions on the IBTC? Just for educational purposes, uh, archeological, what are some of the the items that would have to be cleared? Like, is it like a cemetery or stuff like that? No, thankfully not a cemetery. These are basically going to be deposits of uh, civilization, which include, in this case, because of uh, the proximity to the River Delta, it's going to be evidence of cooking. So communal cooking fires, there's these like clay balls that they tend to find in certain deposits of uh, of carbon in and around those areas. So fortunately, no human remains, but part of going back going back in there and digging things up is, you know, um, still having that open out there. And I guess that's one of the reasons why TechSide would rather, or on the side of caution, and do some of the curation now of the more minimal deposits that we found so far and make sure that, that is, uh, that's all we have on the project before we proceed uh, full board to do, get it shovel ready. Do you know if do you know if in fact some do exist or is this exploring? Given the the depth at which we're at and the the fact that we've already done trenching about a meter deep and about which is you know you're three and three point two eight feet deep by about eighteen feet wide, we've dug a lot of trenches along those areas and have yet to find anything. And essentially, when you find a deposit, you dig a little deeper. So in the areas where there was those uh, those like uh, more like communal cooking deposits, they actually dug deeper and didn't find remains. So we feel pretty confident that that there wouldn't be much more to be found. But at this point, it's about revisiting those sites that have been found and documented in the archaeological resource survey report, and uh, and say, and telling telling the state and the feds how it is we're going to mitigate the deposits that have been found 
so that those don't become a, a, a burden on the project down the line. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Director, this is Pilar. And just in layman's terms, these are ancient campsites for the uh, indigenous tribes that you know inhabited the area. And if I remember correctly, some of the carbon dating goes back about 5,000 years. Um, and so that's basically what we're dealing with. Yeah, that was my next question. How far back? That's a long time, 5,000 years. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, and we have to bring in some experts, you know, for not just that, but for botanical remains, for mollusks. And so that's why uh, uh, the level of effort required for the archaeological mitigation plan is a little higher because you basically have to get clearance from, you know, a geoarchaeologist, a lot of different, about five to seven experts uh, in those different uh, archaeological aspects to make sure that the plan would address anything that we might encounter out there. Uh, with that being said, uh, I-69 connector, there's been no other, uh, uh, you know, public meetings that have taken place. The last activity, major activity were feasibility studies that um, had culminated in public meetings held in December of 2019. That's slide number 10. Slide number 11 on the West Loop. We did conduct uh, a kickoff meeting on the interlocal with Mission. Uh, I know that we're um, we're underway in trying to get some scopes developed for them for environmental and traffic engineering projections. They uh, they have a stated interest in um, in working with the state with TechStock to make their project intentions known and therefore their procurement policies get reviewed through the state to then turn around and start conducting these procurements for services that would help get us through the environmental clearance of the Madero rail site uh, on the mission side while they bring a Mexican partner online to do the same process but on the Mexican side of that of that site where the presidential permit already exists so we're underway we'll have a lot more to report here in the next by the next meeting but uh, we're going on that in earnest any any questions on that Hearing none, thank you all. Anything Chairman, else? this is not... Yes, sir. No, oh, go ahead, Chairman. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and go on to uh, the consent agenda. Chairman, directors, the next item um, is the Unknown consent agenda. Unknown participant is now joining. Uh, all matters listed under the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the governing body and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. However, if discussion is desired, that item or items will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered uh, separately. Chairman, we, we ask that you take a, a roll call on all items voted on so that we can have a, a, a recorded record um, for everyone's vote since we are only audio taping this. Okay. David, I shall move to the consent agenda. I have a motion for the consent agenda. Second. 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 Oh, was that you, Paul? Okay. Uh, I'm can, I, can I get a vote from you, Paul? Yes. Yes. And yes, yes me as well. All five were. Yes, Zeke. Yes, right. Yes, yes. Okay. So everybody uh, voted yes. Correct. Okay. So a motion, second, all all favor say aye. So they all approved. Those opposed, same. Okay. Okay. Chairman, Director, the next item on your agenda is item 3A, is resolution 2020-10. Approval of a work authorization number approval of work authorization number six, the professional service agreement with Blanton and Associates to provide ar archaeological mitigation plans for the IDC project environmental clearance document. Um, this is the item that that um, we described to you in workshops through those uh, environmental uh, or the uh, archaeological activities. Uh, staff has negotiated work authorization in the amount of $131,398. Um, staff recommends approval. And how long is that, that study good for? 
so the clearance is met. So it'll be it'll be good for the next you know two years. Two years, okay. Okay, can we get a motion for the approval for uh, work authorization number six to professional service agreement of Latin Associates in the amount of one hundred thirty-one thousand three ninety-eight? Rick, so moved. Mox is now exiting. Mox, um, motion. Uh, Force. Yes. I'm here. Yeah. You get a yes. Yes. Is okay, Alonso. Ricky? Yes. Pettis. Yes. yes. Alonso. Yes. Rick Pettis. Yes. Frank Prado. Yes. And Zeke Drainer. Yes. Motion passed unanimously. All in favor say aye. Aye. Both things signed. Motion carries. Resolution B. Uh, 3B is resolution 202011, approval of a contract amendment number five with Blanton Associates to increase the maximum payable amount uh, due to approval of work authorization number um, six. Uh, staff recommends approval. Okay, can I get a, a, a motion of a motion? So moved is Rick. Rick, motion. Can I get a second? Second. Zeke, second. Zeke, second. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. And then I'll aye, get to aye. a vote. I get Alonzo, yes. yes? Yes. Rick? Yes. 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 Alonzo, uh, Forrest? Yes. Paul? Yes. Zeke? Yes. And Mr. Bravo? Yes. Okay. Uh, chairman and directors, we have no further business for the uh, board to consider. Okay. okay, so I'll take that as a motion. To, can I get a motion to adjourn? So move, Zeke, move. Second? No, second. Second. Motion and second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Everybody voted for it. Yes. And uh, meeting, meeting to adjourn. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank, thank, thank you, Chairman thank Director. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Multiple people are now exiting. Multiple people are now exiting. Is now exiting. <laughs>